if you can hear me, clap once. <laughs> if you can hear me, clap twice. If you can hear me, clap three times. So good. My wife works in a grade school. It helps sometimes. Uh, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, for those of you who haven't figured it out, my name is Jake Beatty, and uh, I'm the executive director of the Northwest Maritime Center and um, one of the co-conspirators who dreamed up this thing, uh, Race to Alaska. Um, it's going to be an inch, it's kind of a funny talk, right? Because there's not much to actually talk about. And my hunch is most of you already know a little bit. So how many people actually know already about the Race to Alaska? OK, great. So there are some people who haven't heard about it. This is going to be good. Um, so uh, <laughs> it's, um, I guess, a little bit about the origin story. So what it is, we'll start there. What it is, it's um, the most basic sort of thing. It's, uh, I, I talk about it as. It's an engineless boat race. Uh, it's going to start on June 4th, and it's going to start right here. Um, and there's really, there's kind of like three rules. One, get a boat without an engine. Two, start here, finish in Alaska. <laughs> That's pretty much the thing. Uh, and uh, if you win, you get 10 grand. And if you come in second, you get a set of steak knives. Uh, uh, if you come in third or anything else, you just get to really, really impress with yourself. Um, so we'll get in a little bit. I, there's a, there's a, is everyone see, has anyone not seen the video? Good, good, because that won't be, it'll be less boring for you people. Uh, there's a real short video that I'm really proud of. So uh, it, sh it stars a few people in the room, so that's fun too. That's my favorite part. <laughs> the, the skeptical knowing seagull. <laughs> So a little bit about the origin story. This race was actually born in a beer tent a year ago at the festival. Um, <laughs> like all good ideas, really, right? Like all good ideas. Uh, and it, really, the idea was it's such a great way to be on the water. It's, uh, so my passion is how I, how I am on the water these days. I went from tall ships to really small long boats and then to even smaller boats for recreational. I just spent um, the winter doing a Hobie 16 trip in Baja with someone in the back. Um, they were on a 15-foot dory with their five-year-old, and we caught up on a Hobie 16 that we bought for 600 bucks, and then sold for 600 bucks at the end of the trip, which is really good. Um, but engineless, simple, uh, affordable, accessible, all the reasons really to focus attention on this type of boating. And people have been doing this route to Alaska for millennia, starting with the dugout canoes and the Haida's coming down here. Apparently, the Haida's word for the San Juans was the same as their word for slaves. Uh, so they were coming here a lot. Um, and people, have been doing, people do it on kayaks every year. I just learned about a guy who did it on a jet ski. It took him 30 hours, which is not how I'd like to do it. Um, and so really, the idea was to start this conversation about inspiring people to do big things on small boats, or at least engineless boats, and starting the conversation that gets people into adventure. Uh, that's the goal. Uh, and the form of it came from the last two bullet points. I really like simple, and I hate rules. 
So we try to keep it as simple and rule free as possible. And the wide open format's really starting this amazing conversation about what boat and what route and what's, ah, it's so frustrating because it's so simple. <laughs> so the rules are pretty simple. Let's get a boat without an engine. We went over that part. Start there. Port Townsend, finish, catch a can. <laughs> Be self-supported. And the worst slides are when you read all the slides. There it is. That's it. Simple. Really easy. So if you're first, you get 10 grand. There's, like all simple rules, there's a few extra sort of embellishments on that. Uh, you start here in, in Port Townsend, and then the first stage of the race, there's two stages. One is here to Victoria, and the second stage is from Victoria to Ketchikan. We did that for a couple reasons. One, a few of us don't have time to do an entire trip to Ketchikan. So anyone who wants to can join for this pretty epic crossing of the Strait of Juan de Fuca in an engineless boat. And so you can just sign up for the first stage. And that's the stage I'm going to do. Um, and anyone who else wants to do that can just do that part. Uh, and that, if, it's a pretty big trip to do engineless if there wasn't the other people going to Ketchikan. So it's pretty epic in its own right. Um, and we'll have a big party in, in Victoria. We also wanted to make sure that customs were out of the equation so that your race time didn't have anything to do with how fast you could get your passport stamped. Um, so we go to Victoria, it will have involved some, it's a nice Canadian partnership. So the, Victorian, uh, the Victoria Maritime Museum is really excited to help us out with some of the festivities and things. Colin's neighbor, apparently. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it helps to he'll live next to Colin. Uh, and uh, the other piece is, it's a qualifier. So anyone who can get across the Strait of Juan de Fuca Angeles without getting rescued um, can continue on for the rest of the race. Um, we basically, it's hard enough to think about how to do this without killing people. Uh, and that's really something, and I, I don't mean that lightly, like someone died just recently out of Prince Rupert in an Angeles boat. So this, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an adventure that is fraught with risk. And so what we wanted to do was make sure there was a sorting hat of sorts to make sure that the people at least able to do this piece. Where it's, there's three big crossings. There's the crossing in Strait of Juan de Fuca, there's this crossing at the north end of Vancouver Island, and then Dixon Interest at the north part of Ketchikan. So people can at least get across this, they've proven their ability to cross one. Um, so that's kind of the logic of why Victoria. Uh, but after that, there's just one other stage, and it's you can stop wherever you want, you can go all 24 hours a day. You just have to go through Bella Bella, and you have to go through Seymour Narrows. Those are the two sort of waypoints. And there's a lot of argument about whether those were good choices or bad choices, but those are the waypoints. Uh, yeah, sure. Is there a check-in process defined yet? I mean, you're going to have to, I assume, at least wave at somebody on the way through and see where <laughs> We'll be watching. Yeah. <laughs> We'll know, we'll know, we'll know. Well, everyone will have a spot tracker or some sort of device on board, and that's one of those details we're figuring out now. We just want to get the race ready to go. Um, but I'm hoping to get a salvage, like a predatory salvage company to sponsor the Seymour Narrows leg so, they, <laughs> so that they can be there to rescue people and make a profit. Brian. Can you get a toe? No toes. So look at that, Good, nice segue, sir. So the self-supported part uh, is there's no support boats, there's no pre-arranged supply drops, uh, and we kind of took a no switching crew. So whoever shows up as part of your boat, that's who you're going to have for the whole race. And you know you can you can all get off the boat and get and get back on, but you're not going to swap out people. And it, we kind of took a, a a page out of the playbook of. This is, um, so this race sounds ridiculous. There's a really ridiculous race called the Tour Divide, which is a, an off-track mountain bike race from Banff to Mexico. Uh, it's like 20, 3,500 miles, and it's, it's uh, people do it in like 20 days. And just bike on these dirt roads on these mountain bikes. It's amazing. Um, and, and they do it because it, it helps level the playing field. It takes, it takes the money advantage out a little bit so that people, you can't just have a boat hovering to help you, you know, uh, fix out, you know, fix a tire or whatever. So the same's here. We don't, we, we want people to do this for the adventure of it and do it for the trip rather than do it um, and have the America's Cup boat break and then get fixed and then break and then get fixed. Like you gotta, you gotta be on your own a little bit. What that means though is that you can stop in towns and buy stuff if you want. Um, basically anything that's available to everyone is available to everyone. So no supply drops. We, any store that's open to everyone you can go and shop at. Um, 
the, the course ray is there, and uh, you should be able to use it. If you, you can collect oysters. They're out there for everybody, too. Um, <laughs> you can have as many people on your boat as you want, though. Like, if, if you had a trireme you know, with 100 rowers, as long as all 100 rowers are on board at the end of it, that's fine. Well, you got to stay on board. <laughs> <laughs> rules are rules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'd still be on board, I guess. Yeah, that's true. That's good. Uh, so there's no, the boat, so the boat without an engine, it can be any length. Uh, it can be uh, any, you can have as many people. Just you, you, no engine on board, not even just in case. Like not even outboard, not an inboard that's disabled and tagged. Like it just can't be on board. Um, so the, the other caveats around the, the prize is the first prize for whoever finishes first gets $10,000. The second prize does get a set of steak knives, and we don't know if they're nice steak knives or not yet, but it's the only boat race I think that might get a steak knife sponsor, and that's pretty exciting. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing is, though, people, it's, uh, it's consternating to people that you could have a kayak racing against an America's Cup boat or the Charles W. Morgan. Anything, like, regardless of size, it's just human and wind propulsion. Uh, but there's only one prize, or two prizes, really. Um, the rest of them, in, which we're going to create as many classes as possible once we figure out who's in the race. Uh, and so far as we know, there's been no similar timed or sort of adjudicated race along this route. So everybody gets to be a world record holder for the first year. Uh, and that's kind of nice. You can get, if you've ever wanted to be in the Guinness Book of World Records, this might be your chance. Um, People like to hate this race, uh, at least complain about it. So, so far, the biggest complaints are the money ruins everything because just putting money on the table destroys the spirit of community and winner take all is really not about that. So that's, that's something that's out there. Other people hate the money because they don't think they're gonna win it. Um, because they're, they're a surf ski person and they know that, or in their minds, that the hydrofoil you know, Larry Ellison's boat's gonna beat him, so that's annoying. Uh, and that's kind of the second bullet point. It's not fair for my type of boat, whether that's a paddle board or whatever, and you know, it's, uh, you just get another boat. Uh, <laughs> it's too expensive. So the, the, the entry fee to the race right now is $650, and um, that's mostly because we're trying not to lose our shirt on the race, and all of a sudden, we, like, we started out with a $10,000 expense. Um, so, well, there's a couple ways we're going to have some. Right now, we have a Kickstarter campaign on the way underway. And we're offering three 50% off entry fees uh, for people who uh, sign up. Sign up now. Uh, that's how we're going to try to raise the the, the ten thousand dollars through our Kickstarter campaign. Um, and uh, there's also in the future, there's going to be a couple sort of Facebook campaigns or like show us your video of why you think you should get in for free, and maybe we'll let you in. Uh, other people hate that it's a race at all. There's a lot of forum activity around this. There's several sort of internet communities that are just like blowing up and getting annoyed at this race and excited about the race and annoyed at it again. Uh, and some of them hate it because it's just a race at all. And why would you want to race through this stretch of the beautiful country that's so beautiful? Uh, why wouldn't you just want to cruise? Um, that's valid. Then you should just cruise it. That's the kind of my action to that one. Uh, there's another set of events on the East Coast called, uh, put on by a group called Water Tribe, and um, there is some odd pushback around uh, that it's, the Water Tribe events are better because there's a little bit more structure, they have more checkpoints, there's a little bit more, they call them natural, they have to be beachable boats, um, and that's a valid point, and they're great events. Uh, no competition, it's just we're doing something slightly different. Definitely, I think it's inspired from the same energy of getting people onto the water and doing things that are exciting, though. Um, and other people are really mad that they can't just disable their motor um, and have it there just in case. But much like the rule of not having a safety boat or a safety net uh, for the race, we really want, I feel like safety nets and motors are often actually inhibitors of safety because people will get themselves in situations that they then depend on their motor or safety net to, to get them out of. Um, and if you know you don't have any safety net, you're going to be a little bit cautious. Uh, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons why we, we have a no motor on board at all rule. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that we fig haven't figured out yet, and that's just on the table. And we'll fi 
the biggest goal of our, this event was to get it out there so people can start talking about it and signing up for it. And then we'll figure the rest of this stuff out in the remaining nine months. Uh, so one of the big questions is, the first leg of the race as a filter is across a big piece of open water straight to Juan de Fuca. People are worried that we'll start the race on June 4th regardless, and we're not going to do that. We just haven't figured out what the forecast level is that we will hold the, hold the race back and delay it for a day. It's really important to me that any other stage of the race, the racers are really in control of whether they're in the, in the weather window or not. The first stage is the only one that we're shoving people into, into whatever weather conditions are out there. So we'll be monitoring that. The other one is how long do you, what's the, what's the time window to get to Victoria? We haven't defined that either. We're, at this point we're thinking probably 36 hours because it encourages more participation and it gives people a more ability to moderate the sort of their weather uh, and the tides and things like this. Um, anyway, the, the start is a little bit undefined. Um, spot, tracker diesel, uh, spot trackers are these satellite trackers that you can, you know, you can monitor your friends and family or uh, the emergency sort of response folks uh, in the Coast Guard and things can, can go to the website and make sure vessel traffic control can make sure that they see who, where you're at. Um, there's a lot of active shipping. So every boat's <laughs> going to be required to have these transponders that can track in real time where people are. Um, and what we haven't figured out is how to do it the most cost effectively. I've just learned yesterday that Swiftsure Race uh, actually owns a bunch and rents them to people uh, who then can just use them for that race. And so we'll be having that conversation because well, it's really important and uh, for the viewing audience at home and for safety that people have them on board, it's, it's another cost that we're trying to, try to minimize for folks. We don't know, people have asked how many people you let in the, the, the race and I think we don't really know how many people want to at this point. Um, so far, about six people have signed up uh, for one stage or another, uh, including a couple people in this room, so that's pretty exciting. Um, and we don't know how many, like, we don't want to do it so it's so crazy that it gets out of control. We kind of want to minimize the sideways potential in this thing, or at least keep it in a controllable level. My hunch is probably around 50, I'm going to start getting nervous. Um, I would also be over the moon excited if 50 people actually want to do this. Um, one thing, 10,000 people. What's that? 50 people, 10,000. Exactly. That's what we're hoping for. Uh, that's my biggest goal. I have board members in the room too, so <laughs> my, their biggest goal is that I don't lose ten thousand uh, dollars. Colin Angus, is, his picture is here. He's actually over there in the orange, orange hat. I put him on this slide because I feel like he figures everything out, uh, and this is him like skeptical stare at me to figure stuff out. <laughs> I'm gonna put it on my desk. Like you gotta call him up. You're. There's a lot of logistics around the starts and finishes that we'll be diving into after the Wooden Boat Festival, uh, especially the Victoria piece. Um, and then the Ketchikan piece is a little bit nuanced as well. I would love to have a big finish party, but uh, when Colin finishes in like four days, uh, and then like I, if I was rowing, would finish in a month, um, it's hard to have a party that lasts three weeks. Um, <laughs> but we'll try. Yeah. Uh, the, the finish line is, is a little bit um, interesting in that we don't know how long it's going to take. I think four days would be ambitious. Uh, there are certainly some online people who were nervous about Larry Ellison entering and finishing in four days. Our original concept is that we're going to have a sweet boat, also undefined, uh, that starts from Port Townsend as soon as the first place finisher s finishes. Um, and makes about 75 miles a day as sort of a rolling disqualification line that catches up to people. If they're stranded, they'll find them and say, do you need any water or a lift? Uh, or if they're still rowing away happily, uh, they can say, you can continue rowing if you like, um, but you're out of the race at this point. Good job. See you next year. Um, and that, so it'll be basically 10 days after the first person finishes will be when the race ends. Um, so the, it's sort of this race to beat the sweet boat if you're people like me. Um, <laughs> People were worried about Larry Ellison finishing in four days and then putting in 650 bucks and then like just having it go up in smoke after 14 days, which would be a pretty aggressive, I think, to get, to get done. So we, ba we changed the rules slightly. It's going to be the sweet boat finish. The race is over basically 10 days after the first person finishes or July 4th-ish, uh, whatever happens last, just to give people a minimum of, sort of amount of time that they, they know that they can complete the race within a window. Um, then they are victorious. Uh, 
there's a bunch of other stuff we probably haven't figured out, and that's the last bullet point. Uh, so if there's questions right now, uh, I'd be happy to take those, and I might not know the answers. Yes? Uh, how are you going to deal with the uh, no sailing into Anna Harbor and Victoria? I don't know yet. But luckily, we have Canadians uh, on our side. <laughs> Maybe they have to row in. I don't know. We, maybe we don't even go into the Inner Harbor. I'd love to start in the Inner Harbor because it'd be so cool. Like everyone would be looking at it. Um, but we'll figure that out. You. Yeah, the 650, is that per boat or per person? Uh, per boat. And then I, I think it's. Oh, yeah, sure. So the first question was how do we deal with sailing into the Inner Harbor? The answer was I don't know. Um, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We have Canadians on our side. Uh, I was made an honorary Canadian. I forgot my pin. Um, uh, the, sorry? Can you sing old Canada? Uh, no, not yet. Um, and uh, the second question was, is it 650 per boat? And it's 650 per boat plus 50 bucks a person over. Like, uh, so a, a single person would be 650, a team of two would be 700. And that's because we have like, you know, hot dogs and t-shirts to buy and stuff like that. Did you say Kiwi too? No, I did not say Kiwi too. Got customs on this end figured out. How about the other end? We're going to figure that out too. Uh, so th the question was, uh, how do how do we deal with customs in Ketchikan? And uh, we're in contact with the Ketchikan community. The it's pretty cool actually. Ketchikan Yacht Club is uh, uh, becoming an, a, a sponsor of this race, and they they're going to be donating moorage and uh, like they're going to try to do homestays for people once they get up there because they're really excited. The Harbor Master is really excited about it. Um, so they're aware that the race is coming, and we basically said we'd like to help your help in figuring out logistics such as that. Um, so we'll be working on that as well. Jesse? Uh, can uh, teams or, or uh, boats seek sponsorship to offset the cost? Yeah, it's great. Do it. So, so the question was, um, can boats seek sponsorship? And the answer is yes, definitely. Um, this is, again, very little rules. Um, if you can get sponsored, more power to you. Maybe you can make money on the race, Jesse. <laughs> That'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's $10,000 plus whatever sponsor you can get. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Yes? How do U.S. customers feel about people landing and camping along the way once they cross the line back into Alaska before they're able to check in and catch again? They'll probably take a dim view of it, but we'll work with them. Uh, the question was uh, customs, U.S. customs, once you cross over the Dixon entrance and into Alaska, uh, it's about 90 miles, I want to say. That's true. So it's about 90 miles between the border and Ketchikan proper, and how, what will, how will customs deal with that? And w luckily, we've had some pretty good relationships with customs and, uh, here, and so I'm hoping we can, we can, we can leverage that and, and, and work with them up there as well. One thing I'd like to do it by telephone if you prearrange it. The question was, would, can you prearrange customs by telephone? You used to be able to, and then um, I don't know if you still can. There's no phone on there. Yeah, it's true, right. There's no phone reception. So I, that's, that's one of these things we haven't figured out yet, but we'll figure it out. Yes, John. Um, customs might, live, might be able to live with the idea if you provide a list of all competitors with all of their passport details and so on. That's a great idea. They do that in the big Maui race. Oh, great. Free good. Good workshop, people. That's good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, Scott. Um, I assume that the uh, Coast Guards, both U.S. and Can Canadian, are going to be aware of this uh, by the time it happens. I'm wondering if uh, they might... You have to have a green permit. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they might end up stationing some sort of a boat near enough to the touchy places like Cape Caution and, and Dixon Entrance um, just during, you know, for a week or something when, because I can imagine, especially if you're in contention for that 10,000, getting there and the weather's not really what you'd want, but there's this other boat that's right next to you that if they go for it, do I have to go for it? And it it'd be nice to, yeah, I can imagine the Coast Guard's thinking, you know, we, it'd be nice to have somebody nearby. Uh, Admittedly, that's, that's getting, that might encourage stupidity. So the comment was uh, maybe the Coast Guard would have people hang out next to the, the dangerous areas. And I think that's, that's I would imagine that's likely. Um, and, but we're also working with, uh, we've, we've let a lot of the communities along the route know that the race is coming and that we'll be, we'll be 
touching base with them. So at least the life-saving and sort of uh, salvage and like boat US type folks along the route will be aware of the race and know, know of the, the, uh, the, the, the tracking website so that while we don't provide specific safety net, that the safety net that does exist is well informed. Uh, there is going to be a marine, per the, the first part between here and Victoria, like we're working with the Coast Guard, they'll probably be on station. Coast Guard Auxiliary likely will be uh, there as well. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to manage as much as we can that first leg. Uh, yeah? I'd like to explore the definition of engine less a little farther. We're just talking about propulsive engine only and not the engine. Are you, you know, there's lots of motors, there's bilge pumps and things like that. If there's a doubt, it's not going to happen. That's, that's sort of the rule of thumb. So. Uh, yeah, so the question was, define engineless, and I think, you know, if, it's, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's primarily for propulsion. Okay. So if there's any way for your engine to, if you have a bilge pump that is run from a generator and it's got like a high flow and it's pointed aft. <laughs> <laughs> likely not, likely not, right, yeah. John. Just a little further on that, there is a debate amongst the international um, yacht racing com community going on at the moment because there are quite a lot of high profile, very fast, particularly single or two-handed boats that require an engine to be running to run the systems. That would have to be out, right? I think so, yep. Bilge pumps may be, but not much else. Yeah. Hand bilge pumps. We'll, <laughs> we'll try to find a simple way around that. Um, yep. yeah, everything has to be run on Armstrong. <laughs> right. Yeah. Armstrong power. There was someone who asked me a question about a generator because they have some sort of breathing apparatus or something. One so th there's going to be some exceptions for some extraordinary cases, I'm sure. But as long as it's in the spirit of it, I think I think that's the thing. We're going to hold people true to the spirit of this, and without too many rules, hopefully. Do you pay six fifty if you're just going to Victoria? Oh no, that's right. So it's fifty bucks just to go to Victoria, six fifty the whole way. Um, and that's really just yeah. So you're committed, yeah. How are we covered individually for insurance if somebody sues us for participating in the race? I are we covered by the race for us in a bit? So the race, I'm trying to think. This, so we do races here. At the, the question was, how are we covered liability-wise as a participant if someone sues the race and then the participants of that race? Um, it's not a question I've thought of. We have analogous races that happen, not analogous, we have races that happen here. So I'd have to look into our coverage. I believe because you're a participant in a program here, you're part of the umbrella uh, sort of liability. It doesn't go reverse though. So if you slander someone or you uh, run into a boat because of negligence, um, there's a different liability issue that I'll have to deal with on that one. Yeah. Uh, another general comment. Ketchikan just put in a, uh, a dock crane where you can run a pickup down to to get your engine back in if that's what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Ship it up, right, yeah. There's been a lot of conversation, uh, sort of like, what do we do once we're in Ketchikan? Uh, we got this boat, we're worn out. Um, and so there's, there's a few different answers, and it's in the FAQ, uh, you know, there's some tongue-in-cheek answers like, well, just, if it's inflatable, deflate it and put it in your carry-on luggage. Um, there's we're, a few different answers. There's some people are interested in renting a barge and then sort of going in on a barge rental for getting it back. There's other people that um, maybe will put it on the Alaska State Ferry and trailer it, uh, put it on a trailer and trailer it back. And I have a conversation tomorrow with the Alaska State Ferry System about potentially getting some deals for race participants for backhauling all the stuff. Uh, they have lower southbound volume than they do northbound volume at that time of year, so it actually wouldn't cost them anything to be a pretty big supporter um, of this race uh, by helping the participants out. Uh, there's other folks who just want to race north and then cruise south, uh, and that's, that's another option. Th there's other beginnings of conversations about um, people who want to do deliveries back south, so they don't want to be part of the race, but they want to... Uh, They'll, they'll high five you, take your keys, and, or not your keys, I guess, your oars. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they better not take your keys. Uh, and then take your boat back south. So I think there's a lot of potential for this. Uh, I don't know, we're not organizing it, though. <laughs> um, can you tell us much about the 
history of weather during this particular time. Yeah, it's really frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we picked, so the question was, can you tell us about the history of weather on this route during this time? And one of the reasons we picked the, this time of year for the race was that it's before the fog really sets in. So Alaska and, and the fog, it's brutal. Uh, so that's good for safety. Really long days, um, big tides. Uh, so good for people who are trying to move the tide, at least half the time anyway. Um, <laughs> and the weather's really ambiguous. Uh, so it's kind of the end of the spring weather patterns. It's right before the summer flat calm really sort of settles in. Um, common wisdom, this came up in the design panel. I think you, it was great. You were almost like my shill in that panel. So there's all these boat designers, including John Wellsford, yes, two days ago. And they're, you know, they're talking about boat design. The first question out of the box is, what do you know about this race to Alaska and what boat would you build? Um, and the weather came up, and uh, Sam Devlin, who's done the trip probably more than any, anyone that I know anyway, uh, he, uh, he basically says it's, it's kind of flat, calm, or on your nose, but you really don't know what it's going to do, kind of that, that time of year, um, which adds to the frustrating ambiguity of this whole thing. Uh, we wanted to, we, we tried to create something where it wasn't going to be obvious what type of boat was going to be the right boat, or the type of boat that wins in this year might not be the type of boat that wins next year, or however, however often we do this. Um, <laughs> if we do it all again, we'll see. Um, so it's, the weather patterns are frustratingly ambiguous. It's in transition, and you never really know. Yeah. yeah. But flat calmer on the nose is kind of the conventional wisdom, <laughs> which is why you, you know you're going the right direction, when I, in my experience. <laughs> Is there any way you can see he's got one boat? Who's there to register? Oh, yeah, sure. So, the question is who's registered, what boats are they? Um, I'll tell you my favorite story of registration right now. Uh, it's a woman, she's 68, and she's only doing the first leg, but she's, uh, she rode, all, she's, she's done the ro ro race in a rowboat. She's got a 20 foot Sam Devlin sort of open water rowboat. And she, 10 years ago, did the Ketchikan to Bellingham leg, became the first woman. I think she actually did Skagway to, Ketch to uh, Bellingham. Um, but she's going to join us for the trip to Victoria. She's like, I do the rest of the race, but I'm turning left, and you guys are turning right. She's rowing to San Francisco. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, which kind of makes this look pathetic. Um, <laughs> She's a 68 woman rowing by herself to San Francisco. Um, so she'll be in the race. Uh, there's a couple open water rowboats. There's a couple, there's at least one trimaran, like small sort of raid style trimaran. There's a couple um, like small Westright Potter ish kind of boats that are signed up. One guy's putting a, uh, a sliding seat rig in his Montgomery 16, 15. Uh, so it's cockpit with a, with, a, with a sliding seat rowboat in it. Um, well, the best one, oh, this is my favorite. This, this guy just emailed me. He's got some sort of stand-up paddleboard hydrofoil kiteboard thing that he wants to. <laughs> I was like, whatever. That sounds uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> uh, so far, no canoes. But there's a, there's, there's a, there's, there's, those are the people that I know of. But there's a bunch of people sort of in the wings. One person was talking about a Yankee 30 with a big sweep oar. Um, is that you? Uh, oh, cool. Um, that would be like the classiest way to go. We're trying to figure out which of the boats. Cool. Um, I don't know. Is there any, who, anyone else in the room that has a boat they haven't told me about? <laughs> oh, yeah, Scott. I'm on. You, uh, but you don't know which boat you're using, right? Not for sure, no. No, not at all, in fact. You don't want to give it away right now, either, do you? Uh, I'm <laughs> happy to give it away if I knew. Okay. It, it depends partly on whether I get a partner. If I'm doing it solo, it'd probably be in the Marsh Duck. But if I'm doing it with somebody, then that's a well. Or if you that, sell the Marsh Duck, so the, the Marsh out for sale, right, right there. Yeah. I'm thinking about a try, actually. That's a lot of. There's a lot of sort of nervousness and excitement around sort of the multi-hull side of things. And Dudley Dix, the designer, uh, was talking about some sort of amas that you can bring in or out on some sort of lever apparatus, so you can row to sail or. Which is great. Like, I hope this really, like, uh, if it drives design as much as it's driving the idea about getting people to Alaska without engines, I, I think it's, uh, it's a win. It's a really, it's exciting. Peter, you had a question? Any uh, trials show interest in the 
<laughs> you know, not yet, but we did. Uh, the question was, how, do any tribes uh, sh show interest? Um, so we worked with the local Jamestown tribe to actually, we wrote letters to all the heads of the First Nations and, tr and, and Native communities along the route, um, sort of out of respect that this is, you know, their territorial waters and they've been doing this trip, you know, before anyone else. And so we invited their participation and um, that's like, it, unfortunately, it's kind of right on top of the regular canoe journeys that happen. So I'm not sure how many, um, how many tribal groups will, will, will join, but it would be great if there was a racing canoe next to the Charles W. Morgan, next to Scott and his trimaran, um, <laughs> next to this wingnut kite board hydrofoil guy. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. I think it, is. it was the destination, sorry, this year. I don't know about next year. Yeah. I don't know about next year. Bella Bella. Yep. <laughs> certainly, it's a, it's, a, certainly it's a strong native community, Bella Bella. Yeah. Yes? We have a, a crew list for possible crew. There's for those of us whose wives are not enthused about this. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean you're sending your wife as a crew? or? <laughs> um, there has been discussion about uh, uh, that's something. Yeah, that's right. Right. You're, you're gonna be upset when she comes home with ten grand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there has been discussion of setting up sort of a, an online forum uh, around uh, people who are wanting wanting, to, wanting a ride or wanting a crew, um, and I think that will happen organically. I, it's one of those from a potential side of things like that's there's you know online matchmaking sites or that's not something I really want to be a part of but um, maybe Josh and his on in his small craft advisor yeah okay. <laughs> good but I, I think that is one of the, the opportunities is people who are even though I don't know I'd want to know the person I really well and, yeah and make sure that they, we work together as a crew well because it's gonna be hard and it's there's gonna be times where you're not gonna you're gonna want a good shipmate you know regardless how big your boat is Sorry? Or eight shipmates. Eight shipmates, right. Yes? Will there be like a film crew making a documentary of this? Is that even feasible? There's a lot of interest in a, and so the question was, uh, film crew, will there be a documentary being made? Um, there's a lot of interest of, of, of filming. There's no resources to make it happen. Um, so there have been a few people that have talked to me about a documentary. There's somebody who's interested in a television show, sort of mini series about the race. Um, <laughs> No one's getting voted off the island, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I hope so. Um, there's some interest in um, maybe even having a GoPro camera mounted on everyone's boat, and then people come and switch out the film, uh, give you a piece of beef jerky or something. I don't know, <laughs> as a reward. Um, it's something to be figured out. I hope, I hope so, because I think it's, really, it's, it's going to be an interesting, especially the first year, because it's so unknown. I think it's going to be a great story to, to document. So, um, does anyone have the winning boat? Like, who, who, what do you think is going to win? Anyone got, a, got an idea? <laughs> Dragonfly. Yeah, let's, let's have some conversation about that. Yeah. Uh, the moth. That would be pretty cool. So, the other question is how long is it going to take? That's what I get asked all, asked all the time. And I don't know. Let's take a vote. <laughs> Anybody got ideas? How long is it going to take? A week. A week? Victoria to, Victoria to catch can in a week, 710 miles. That's impressive. Some people are saying a week. Yeah, some people are saying two. I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, 10, 10 days, 10 to 14 days. 10 to 14 days. <laughs> Could be there's weather, there's tides. Yeah, who knows? Mechanical and physical failures. Yeah, I don't know. The party line is going to take three weeks because it seems like it might. <laughs> but I, I really have no idea. Yeah. Other questions? Do you have to finish with everybody you start with? Yeah, no switching out crews. I mean, so if there's a medical problem, you can get you can always get rid of crew, I guess, if there's a real problem. <laughs> you know, like like I don't I don't think someone hurt should have to stay on the boat, right? If you have to get someone off of the boat, but I I don't think you should be able to no no replacing them certainly. Uh, so. Uh, to get shirts as attractive as this, uh, this is the blatant self-promotion part, uh, we started a Kickstarter campaign to try to raise money to at least seed the pot for uh, uh, the, the $10,000 prize. And so we have, 
amazing things from as little as, as five or ten dollars. We're gonna get pictures of people for ten bucks. You can take your face, picture of your face, and we'll slip it on a Collins boat or someone else's boat, and you can, your face can go all the way to Alaska. <laughs> so you can, for ten bucks, you can say you did the race. Um, also, my other favorite is the race to a flaska. That's a good one, right? <laughs> a, f a race to Alaska, a commemorative flask. Uh, then we have more expensive stuff, the trucker hats, the t-shirts. We have this ridiculous fur hat that Kelly Watson's modeling here. Because uh, nothing says Alaska than that. Um, and then for 500 bucks, you can come to, you don't even have to, you can just fly to catch a can. We'll give you all the gear. You can go to the race to Alaska party. Um, that we haven't planned yet. <laughs> but it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be a lot like that, just with less dancing and more fleece, is my hunch. Uh, and any other answers you're looking for, uh, if they exist, they'll be on the website, racetoalaska.com. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm sure you heard this, but the website is a pain in the butt to read the forum. Can you change the- like, The forum's the horrible. I think what we're gonna do is, uh, we talked to Josh at Smallcraft Advisor. They have a really functioning forum that's lovely. Uh, and as one of the race sponsors, he's going to take it over, I, I hope. I'm going to shame you into doing this in front of everyone. Great. Because it's, it's been frustrating. I've been working with it, and it's, it's, uh, we have issues that aren't going to get fixed. So I think it'll work. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the forum, will, you'll still be able to go to it through the Race to Alaska, and it'll just link over to whatever it goes to in a more legible format. Yep. Um, Unless there's other questions people want to hang out and like discuss and you know theorize. Find crew, find crew <laughs> right. Who <laughs> yeah, anyone need crew or want crew? Yeah. What's the last day to sign up provided there's not a June fourth. <laughs> <laughs> last day to sign up. As long as, as long as you sign up before, <laughs> Yeah. 